Hello, my name is Sybil Ruscoe and each week on The Big Interview I'll be meeting some of the key figures in the golf industry. I'll be finding out what makes them tick and find out about their successes and their challenges and give you an insight into what's happening behind the scenes. And over the next few weeks as golf emerges from the lockdown we'll be finding out how the grassroots level of the game and the professional level have been changed by Covid-19. Just what will the new normal look like on the golf course? The first big interview is with Jim Croxton, the Chief Executive of the British and International Golf Greenkeepers Association. And his members have been maintaining golf courses while we've been locked down, and they're helping to shape the way golf will look as courses reopen. So for the first big interview on the Golf Industry Network, let's meet Jim Croxton. Well, Jim Croxton, welcome to the big interview. It's great to have you here as our first interviewee. I suppose we need to kick off and say, what have your members been doing while we've been locked down? What have been the key jobs that people have had to get on with? Well, really, when the, when the lockdown began um, towards the end of March, the grass wasn't growing terribly quickly across the golf course, but we were, we were pretty close to when that was going to take place. So... We had to work with government to try and define what, what they considered essential maintenance to be. Um, and, and predominantly over those first two or three weeks, it was, it was mainly just, just, just keeping on top of any growth there was in, in, on the grass. So they were mowing greens, tees, fairways, etc. Very little mowing of the rough areas. Um, and I think that could be one of the main things that people notice when they go back to golf courses, that a lot of the rough areas may have got, may have got much longer. Once the growth began in April, and, and this time of year is normally... Um, quite a big time for greenkeepers to be doing maintenance in, in preparation for, this, for the start of the golfing season. So a lot more activity has taken place, top dressing, aeration, uh, nutrition, uh, and indeed we had such a dry and, and actually warm in places April that um, the irrigation took place as well. Yes, I was thinking of all the greenkeepers when I saw how, kept looking at the weather forecast, we were all wishing we were on the golf course, but of course that dry weather, after all the wet weather, doesn't make it an easy job for your people, does it? Probably, probably in some respects a little easier after such a wet winter. It meant that work could get on. Um, maybe a little harder to get the surfaces to be in perfect shape, but because there wasn't much golf taking place, then actually not too bad. I think the guys would have preferred a dry month to a wet one anyway. Now, what about the expectation of how our golf courses are going to play when we get back on the courses? Because, of course, we're all watching lots of videos on Twitter and social media of those beautiful fairways, lovely greens. How are you going to manage expectation when we do get back on the course? Because we're all expecting a perfect golf course because nobody's been playing on it. Is that going to be the case? Um, it, it isn't, although there are some advantages. I mean, all this time without play means that divots, for example, will probably have grown back into reasonable shape. The pitch marks will have, will have, will have come out. Um, surfaces themselves, the playing surfaces, should be pretty good. But in simple terms, on average, golf clubs have had about 100 hours of, of staff time per week over this last six weeks or so, compared to a normal average of around 250. So in simple terms, 40% of, of maintenance means 40% of condition. Our members are very proud people, they're very passionate about their golf course, so they will have worked very hard uh, in that time. And they have been able to be a little more efficient because no golfers, no tee markers, no flag sticks makes the work a little bit uh, smoother. But, but in reality, the surfaces won't be where they would normally be. The rough areas and the attention to detail. I mean, for example, most clubs have just ignored bunkers throughout this entire time. So when we get the go-ahead to play again, there'll be quite a lot of work needed on bunkers. I have to say the majority of golfers I've seen on social media seem to be just saying they, they don't care. They just want to get back out and swing the club and get some fresh air. And I hope that uh, continues. But there has been some, some evidence of people expecting Augusta um, when, they, when they return. And of course, that's a problem. And um, we are... We're doing quite a lot of work with the media, with golfing media, with our own members. Um, we've produced guidance for every golf club in the country. We've worked closely with the PGA, the Golf Club Managers Association, other organisations. And part of that is about managing expectations. And we're hoping that the golf clubs will, will do their bit. Because in the end, when you find out you can play, it will be from your golf club. And I'm, I'm hoping that communication says, for goodness sake, enjoy your round. And don't worry about whether the rough is a bit long. Just, just get out and enjoy it. Let's talk more about those guidelines because Bigger have been involved in helping shape how golf might look when we get back on the course. 
Um, what are your key areas of concern, do you think, operationally? Um, you know, when people are back out on the golf course with your members and, you know, particularly teams and managers having to deal with everything. What, what do you think are going to be the key challenges and what are the most important things do you think that you've put in place that will get us playing again? The, the key challenge is going to be goal for behaviour. I don't say that being especially um, negative about it, but but when we're in our leisure time, you know, people like to be less bounded by by rules and regulations. Golf, golf is, is a very rule heavy sport, but you know, goal, one of the reasons things we've been missing is is social interaction. Um, the last time I was on the golf course was just before the lockdown started, and and a couple we know walked up to us, and, and I had to go into reverse as they walked closely to us, and and just kept getting getting too close close than two meters and I think a lot of members will see our, our members the green keepers and, and want to come and say hello and, and that interaction will be welcome for the green keepers they, they've missed golfers believe it or not and they, they didn't used to say that a lot of them <laughs> um, but we're, we're going to need to make sure that everyone continues to observe whatever distancing regulations are in place the main thing we also are worried about is the evidence from other countries that have opened golf courses before us is that every day becomes like Saturday. The golf courses are absolutely mobbed. Um, I guess that's to do with people working from home, a lot of retired people, but also a lot of people who are on furlough. I read some stat today that say half the people in the country are currently on the government's payroll because of this furlough scheme. So there'll be a lot of people playing um, and we need to make sure that we keep some distance between golfer and greenkeeper. So we're advising clubs to ensure there are windows of opportunity. I think you'll see um, a kind of a, a, a starting time that mustn't be brought forward. So if your club says eight or 8.30, it's to enable the greenkeepers to get ahead. I know a lot of golf clubs are going to work on a 2T start and play nine hole golf to get people on the golf course. But that means our members have got to get ahead of play in two places on the golf course. Um, and I think you'll see golf clubs identify a window, maybe a quiet afternoon during the week when they say, right, no golf today to allow additional maintenance to take place. And what about your members having to almost police golf courses? Do you foresee some conflict there? You know, if two people go off and they wait for their mates at the second hole or, you know, you're playing too quick, keep away. How do you feel your members will be able to police those new ways of playing golf, if you like, because of COVID? Well, the last few weeks have been very interesting because the only people at the golf club have been the greenkeepers. And because of that, we've seen a lot of members of the public going on golf courses, using those wide open spaces. And the vast majority have, have been very respectful. I've seen some really nice stories of people going out and enjoying the open area and doing no damage at all. Of course, there's been some, some unpleasant things as well, some motorbike riders destroying greens and things, but it's been minority in general. We've advised our members during that time to not engage with the public too closely, simply to report it if need be to the police, if it's antisocial behaviour, or to keep their distance. The beauty of the game opening is, is that there will be other people on site that, that, that work for the facility, maybe the managers, the professional staff, could even be that some of the committee members or volunteers will be around. And so we'll be advising our members again to not get involved in altercations, uh, to, to do their job and to report up the chain of command as appropriate. Um, I actually think that this six weeks or so that we've all lived in this rather strange world has changed player behaviour or people's behaviour, should I say. Before the lockdown, golfers were struggling to deal with the concept of distancing. Um, in fact, they were almost seemed to be rebelling um, against the idea. And, and we, we, I saw some amazing photos from, from our members saying that some of the things that golfers had done supposedly in this distant world. I mean, we, we heard one story of, of golfers sharing a hip flask prior to lockdown, which seemed to be an extraordinary thing to think about. I think we've all learned an, an amazing lesson. Um, you know, when we've been going out as a, on a, as a family for our exercise, you know, people are, are keeping their distance, are being pretty cheery as well. Um, and I think, I think generally speaking, people will have learned to behave differently. Um, we don't want our members to get involved in, in fights and, and arguments. So as I say, we'll be advising them to try and use the chain of command. But I, I think golf will be pretty happy just to be out there. And Jim, what about the relationship between the teams looking after the courses, your members and owners and operators of golf courses? Because financially, there's going to be a lot of pressure on some business, isn't there? You know, they need people playing on golf courses to keep those golf courses open. How are you going to manage the sort of pressure that some of your members might be under from some of the owners and operators because they're going to be saying come on we need people on the course don't we to to keep this place viable absolutely in fact this week uh, already we've advised our members um 
to make sure that they're ahead of the game. And, and the, the phrase I've used quite a lot is to try and be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. To an owner in particular who, you know, whose own money is or, is or currently isn't in the till, um, this is a very sensitive solution, uh, situation. Interesting, by the way, um, the, 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 the proprietary clubs that we refer to in the country absolutely uh, adopted the furlough scheme far more readily than the private members clubs did. We heard a, uh, it seemed to be that a proprietor's view was what's the, what's the lowest amount of staff I can keep on my golf course to keep it alive, uh, whereas the private members sector seemed to be more about what's, what's the, the minimum amount I need to keep it where our members will expect it. And I think that's interesting that the real sort of profit motive hit the proprietor. Um, over time, interesting enough, we saw quite a lot of private members clubs reduce their team further when they realised they were probably overdoing it. Um, I think the key thing is to, for our members to remember that without golfers, there simply won't be a golf business in the future. Um, we were very concerned to hear reports from other countries that, that a lot of countries went with two ball play at the outset. Um, which will work in a members club environment, but probably won't work in a pay and play environment. And I've spoken to some golf club owners that said they probably wouldn't open under two ball only. The amount of staff needed on site would, would outweigh the benefit of, of, of revenue. Um, but I think the, the best thing our members can do is, is, is ensure that they give clear uh, information to their employers on what they need to do to keep the golf course alive to allow play. And what is your key message to the industry? both to your members and players and people who'll be visiting golf courses? What, what's the key thing you want to say to people? Well, I think it's, I think it's two messages. Apologies if, that, if that's the wrong answer to the question. <laughs> First of all, um, throughout this, golf has been reasonably privileged. Um, at the outset, we got very quick information from government that, that maintenance could take place. Um, in Ireland, for example, that, that message wasn't out there and some golf courses went unmaintained. In, in New Zealand, I think there was about a month without maintenance because it was, it was banned. So we got very clear guidance early that it was permitted. And the, the mood music appears to be that golf will be one of the few things that opens up early. So I think we need to remember that we've been quite lucky as a sport and a business that we can hopefully play along with angling and other things that are coming back that are, that are suitably, suitably, dis, suitably socially distant. So I think remember that, remember that sort of privilege. But the second thing is we've got to remember it's a business. Um, and so every decision taken over the next, what, year i guess from now until till next spring let's hope next spring we're looking forward to a normal season is going to be very very cautious um we will see budgets reduced we will see revenue reduced i i guess we'll see green keeping teams reduced um we'll see redundancies that's the world we're about to live in but we've got to understand that that's necessary um you know the, the economy is going to a pretty dark place for a while so people will have less money in their pockets so our members have got to be very businesslike over this next few months what do you think is the biggest lesson you've learned over the lockdown period? <laughs> well, I mean, from a personal perspective, I think you've got to be, you know, um, mindful of what you have and, and appreciate it while you've got it. Um, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity over the last couple of months to spend so much more time with my children than I normally do. Three meals a day and all sorts. And, and it's been it's been fabulous. Um, and I think as we're allowed uh, some of the things that we take for granted over these next few months, such as playing sport, then hopefully we'll, we'll recognise that the, the world is a reasonably fragile place at times and we need to be lucky about it. We need to, be, we need to remember that we're very lucky. But I think there is an opportunity for our members. I, I, I'm hoping that, um, that golfers will recognise that the work they've done, and they've done in this, I mean, it, it, if you go back two months from now, or maybe six, seven, six, seven weeks or so, there was a lot of terror in the world. No one knew whether they were, if they left the house, they were killing themselves or other people. And I would guess somewhere in the region of seven or 8,000 greenkeepers went to work throughout all this period to keep golf courses um, up and running. Um, it, they weren't risking their lives like, like the NHS were, because I won't, I won't make any, any kind of comparison in that respect. But they were putting themselves out at a time when most weren't. Um, and I think... Uh, I've certainly seen a lot of good stuff on social media in particular that says that golfers appreciate that. And do you think that has given us all a greater appreciation of what your members do? Because we all turn up, you know, we expect the golf course to look great. Do you think it'll give us a better appreciation of what goes on? I, I think it will on, on, on two levels. Again, because people haven't been seeing the golf course, um, then they've relied on social media, for example. And I think it's brought a number of our members more to the fore to make sure they actually that they put that stuff out there. I've seen a lot of guys saying, stop putting photos up, you're teasing me and tormenting me. But realistically, 
um, uh, people have been interested. For example, us at Bigger, we've had far more um, calls from the media for, for, for information the last few weeks because there's been no golf played. So suddenly the whole profession is, is, is more in, in the spotlight. But equally, I think there's a golfers will go back in and see what has changed because maintenance was limited. And that, I hope, makes them recognise um, that each, each sort of greenkeeper on a team is essential. We, we hear a lot of situations where somebody will retire or leave the business and they're not replaced. And the, and the club just think, well, it'll be fine. We'll just carry on with a smaller team. It'll be fine. Now we've got that real sort of scientific test to say, look, if you do less maintenance, you get a different product out at the other end. So now you understand what your money goes on. Um, so I think on both of those levels, there's a real sort of a potential upside for us in this. And are you looking forward to getting back onto the golf course yourself? Where do you play your golf? Well, I'm, I'm currently, because I've got a young family and, and, and the busy job that I have, I'm not a member anywhere. I'm, I'm lucky to play, you know, 10 or 20 times a year, usually on, on very good golf courses. Uh, I'm actually looking forward. With the last game of golf I played was, was the four of us as a family went out and had nine holes at my local club, uh, Nutsford Golf Club, where my kids are members. Um, and I, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And, and funny, I'm missing all kinds of sport at the moment, but golf could be the first one I get back out to do. So a family game is what I'm looking for. And a final question that a few of my friends and people that work on golf courses, we've been talking about this amongst ourselves. To get back on the golf course, do we really need bunkers? Because bunkers seem to be the place that creates all sorts of danger. Uh, it's all right saying don't touch the rake. Somebody came up with an idea of having a fork on the end of a, a club so that you could rake. And then somebody said, well, you still got to touch the sand. To get back on the course, why don't we just do away with bunkers? Well, that's a big question. And, and, and uh, I could be in danger of getting, giving away a soundbite here, which haunts me for the future. I, I, I'll say a couple of things. I, I very rarely come off a golf course and say, I wish that had more bunkers or I wish it had more trees. So we're, we're generally, general, generally kind of over bunkered, I think. And that's, that's a hangover from uh, the way the American golf course has influenced ours through the 80s and, and 90s, I would say. Um, I mean, links golf courses, things like that, the, the, the bunkers are things of beauty, but the, the days of the enormous bunkers, I think, are probably a little bit behind us. It's been a big move in the last sort of 10 or 20 years to make golf courses um, a little bit more, more how they were, and a lot of bunker reduction in, in that time. I personally, I, I'm not a bad bunker player, so I quite like them. Um, uh, the fact that they're not all raked as well as they could be, I think, is probably a positive because I think people have got to the point where they expect bunkers to be pristine and the, and the, and the rule book defines them as a hazard. You're meant to have been unlucky to be in there. So perhaps this um, less obsession with perfect bunkers might be a good thing. And after lockdown and we're on the course, why can't we just kick them out of the bunkers for, for the time being? Kick the ball Absolutely. Out? Absolutely. I think for the first few months, we'll see a real change in the way the sport is played. I think we'll go back to match play, um, a lot less focus on stroke play. I can't see many handicap competitions this year. We'll go back to playing fun golf, gimmies, um, you know, mulligans or whatever it may be. And, and absolutely, if you go in a bunker and you're in a horrible big footprint, whatever, just move it to the side. I think that's the way, that's certainly how I play with my kids. And that, that gives them much more enjoyment when they play. And I think it might be better for all of us. Sounds like my perfect golf, Jim. Thank you. Uh, Jim Croxton, thank you very much for joining us here on The Big Interview. Thank you very much.